O oh God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable to you. You are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So we're in the same part of the Bible now, the Minor Prophets, where you find the verse that 6.8 is named for, Micah 6.8. And I think I knew this already, but this Amos reading is a reminder that there are lots of places in the books where God is angry, right? Uh, like really angry. Um, and as we read today, the grass in the fields is withering up and the snow on the top of the mountain has melted away in the heat of God's anger. It's a life and death situation, and God isn't interested in being appeased or calmed down or bribed with sacrifices and songs and elaborate rituals. God doesn't want to see people dancing around and show in lift service to God's glory. What God wants is not words and rituals that cover up and bandage over and distract from injustice. True worship of God, true tribute to God's glory means taking seriously that God wants justice in human relationships. True worship of God means worship that changes you and takes seriously the nature of God's glory because God's glory derives not from being the strongest and the most able to do some smiting, but from being just, from being fiercely committed to justice among the people of Israel. Worship that glorifies God without inspiring people to do what God wants is, I'll just say, counterproductive, as Amos tells his prophecy. So let me pause for a minute to go to the word justice. When Amos is talking about justice, he doesn't generally mean justice in the, in the form of criminal justice, do the crime, do the time. Although people having to deal with the consequences of their misdeeds can be part of it. But rather, the justice and the righteousness that Amos calls for are about a broader climate of fairness and equality. That if people are strong and powerful, that they will use that strength, they will use that position as a trust to benefit everyone, rather than as an opportunity to exploit and to take advantage of the less and the least powerful. And that every person is afforded respect and care by virtue of being one of God's children. That's the vision. But the thing is, it's easy to mix up what powerful people want with what God wants. Or at least we have plenty of history where that kind of thing happens, right? So for example, you might remember the idea of the divine right of kings from your high school history class. The divine right of kings meant that the kings that you had, whoever your king was, was put there by God, and that to go against the king meant to go against the will of God, which makes it harder to send out a tweet complaining about the latest bad decision, right? Okay, sorry, I had to get one Twitter reference in this week, all right? But in our day, too, even though we don't have a king, it can be easy to confuse God and country and to assume that one, the one wholeheartedly supports the other at all times, when that may or may not always be the case. Amos, though, is not speaking from the vantage point of a powerful member of the royal court, not as a privileged member of the holy priesthood, not as a thought leader and respected pundit, but as a shepherd, as a minimum wage worker who lived way, way outside the beltway. And his words still ring true today. Hey, evil, he says, and do good so that you may live. So with 6 to 8, our three core values are justice and community and spirituality, drawing from Micah 6 8's call to act justly, to love extravagantly, and to walk humbly with God. And I think it's a key strength of our approach that we have these three strands woven into the cord of our life together. Because if we try to practice one without the other two, we can get seriously off course. In our scripture reading, the people Amos cries out against are practicing a hollow version of worship and spirituality without attending to justice or love for neighbor. Sometimes we may find ourselves falling into a mirror image of this problem, concern for and work for justice without the seasoning of love or the energizing and healing foundation of spirituality. 
And a third possibility is love by itself, without justice, or the underpinnings that come from a challenging connection to the living God. This love can exhaust us or become a shallow and self-seeking version of itself. Of course, in some ways, pulling these strands apart is artificial. True love encompasses true justice and true worship of God. Just as true worship of God includes love and justice, and true justice includes love and respect for God. This year in our collective work to live out this call by God to justice and community and spirituality, we at Six Eight have taken action on many fronts. We've come together for worship every week to hear God's word, to share our experiences and our walk of faith, and to worship and to connect with God in music, in the sacrament of communion, in prayer, and in our offerings. But church hasn't stopped at the theater door, right? Two weeks ago was our fourth time visiting homeless folks camped out near Health Care for the Homeless in St. Vincent de Paul along the Fallsway. And we gave out a record number of bag lunches, clean socks, and health kits, and pickles. Was it a record number of pickles? Yes. A record number of pickles, all right. But that's not all. In the spring, we collectively committed to and logged hundreds of hours spent caring for God's creation, trying out new habits, getting involved in new ways, and learning what is going to make, what it's going to truly take to care for this earth that we've been given, all of us, all people, and that we also belong to. In the spirit of love and care, we've helped seniors play bingo. We've sorted thousands of pounds of donated food. We've done gardening, weeding, planted trees, and even wielded a weed whacker or two. And we've given away 10% of our offerings as a tithe and as a model, giving to local and national and international causes. And in June, we had an exciting victory when we helped the national setting of the UCC pass a resolution in protest of the practice of mountaintop removal coal mining, something that devastates the land and the communities of people who live, like Amos did, in the mountains and way outside the Beltway. Way outside the Beltway. And all of this doesn't include the ways that being part of 6-8 helps each of us individually to act justly, to love extravagantly, and to walk humbly with God. Maybe that means praying more, or keeping socks in the car to give away, or explaining to the lady who knocked on our door that God is still speaking, right? Maybe it means taking a chance on doing a new way of on a new way of doing things, or making a commitment to stay faithful in the face of adversity. All of this is a part of and really the point of six eight and why we gather to worship and to serve for our lives together and our lives as we live them out in the big old world. So next week we'll be handing in commitment cards for 2014. If you know you won't be here next week, please put yours in the offering basket today. But these cards and this commitment is a chance to think about and to make a commitment in terms of how each of us can contribute and participate in what Six Eight is doing and what we hope to do in the coming year. And I invite you to pray about how you can take it to the next level. Can you commit time to service and working for justice? Can you reach out to get to know people here? Can you welcome new people and take that welcome out the door by inviting people to join us? Can you take on a new spiritual practice or recommit to an existing one? And finally, I'd like to challenge you to take your financial contributions to the next level. If you're not giving because debts or spending habits are making it hard, the next level might be getting your financial house in order. If you're giving occasionally, see if it can become a monthly commitment. If it's a monthly commitment, think about committing a percent of your income. Three, five, seven, ten, anyone? Make it a stretch. This is one of the most practical things you can do to improve your trust in God. By giving away some of that stuff, that the world around us thinks is more important than God. And then see what God does with those gifts. If what we do here seems like the festivals and the assemblies that Amos is condemning, empty ritual, blind to justice, devoid of love for neighbor, then don't feel an obligation to take it to the next level. But if you see like I do, that what we're doing is on that path that God calls us to, to love to do justice, to love extravagantly, and to walk humbly with God, then support it. Take it to the next level. 
And just imagine where God will take us in the coming year. Thanks be to our just, loving, and ever-present God. Amen.